Whispers in the Trees is a dark podcast currently focusing on the Great White North, surrounding all of our grizzly truths from the kindest place on earth to the head-scratching unknowns hidden beneath the snow. My name is Mads, and join me today on a deep dive into the life and crimes of Clifford Olson II. If you want to support me in my passion in bringing these dark secrets to light, please consider supporting me at buymeacoffee.com forward slash whispers podcast. I'm just going to warn you guys, today's case will include graphic depictions, and I'm saying graphic depictions, of child molestation and rape, violence, as well as drug and alcohol mentions. Viewer discretion is pretty deeply advised and sincerely advised. This was a rough one for me to research, and it's a pretty rough one for really anyone to listen to, no matter how desensitized you are. It's pretty rough to listen to anything happening to a kid, so just viewer discretion is pretty deeply advised. I want to mention here that I work really hard to give the victims in each of the cases that I bring up on my channel as much memorialization as I can. It's really important for me to bring up as much as I can about the victims so that we can think about them more than we can um, think about the person that did these horrible things to them. But this case was really difficult to do. Clifford Olson II tormented the families of his victims through the media and a lot of the families chose to stay in the background because of this. They chose just to back out and to stay out of the media and to stay away. Because of this, it's been so hard to dig up information about these kids before they died. I'm doing my best, but please know that any time I can't give a victim the time and the honoring I want so sincerely to give, it's with regret and it's not with ill intent. Each and every one of these victims is worth as much memorialization as I can and remembrance that I can. But that being said, there is only so much that I can do and out of the respect for their families, I don't want to poke and prod at them. So I have opted not to reach out to them because they've suffered enough through this trial and through this case. But with that being said, Viewer discretion is advised. I'm doing my best to honor these victims the way I hope they be honored in remembering how they died and who they were before they died as best as I can. Those of you who choose to stay, please have a seat around my campfire. These are my whispers in the trees. Clifford and Leona Olson welcomed their first baby boy on New Year's Day, 1940. A new decade and a new step for their family. He was celebrated in the newspaper as one of the New Year's babies and coddled as a little one. Just like so many firstborns and only children are, his mom and his dad kind of coddled him and took to his every whim and want. Little Clifford Jr. grew up in a small house near the Pacific National Exhibition Grounds. The p and is right near the Burnaby in Vancouver. It's just on the border of Burnaby. His dad did a few different jobs while he was growing up, first delivering milk, then he was a construction worker, then later on he would become an apartment building manager, while his mom was a housekeeper. And in the early days, she would actually take little Clifford along everywhere with him. And people apparently loved this little boy. He got attention wherever he went. His parents worked hard throughout his life to provide for their soon-to-be four children. Clifford would quickly gain two brothers and one sister through his life. The family would pick up and move to Richmond. It was a new suburb at the time and just starting to grow out with new buildings built specifically for veterans. His father had fought in the army, but I can't find any documentation about the war or anything specific to his career. Can't really say for sure when or if he was really absent from Clifford Jr.'s life uh, or if it was due to his service if he was. I can't really say anything. To my knowledge, he seemed like an alright dad for the time and pretty typical. 
As far as I can tell, Clifford Jr. had a very normal upbringing. According to his father, Clifford Jr. was always getting into fights when he was a kid, but the fights never really went his way. He was always getting beaten up, and one day Clifford Sr. would recall his son coming into the dining room to tell him he had decided that he wanted to be a boxer. He was only 10 years old at the time, and he would start quote-unquote making his rounds of all the boys that had already beaten him up. He began to train with the school coaches and working towards his goal until he didn't. He apparently loved to be the center of attention and was known to his teachers for conning other students around the school. Some people believe that he was misbehaving this way when he was a kid to get attention that he had lost to his siblings. Like, when he was really young, his mom would take him to work with her. She would pass him along to her co-workers and they would all coddle him and then he had three siblings come out of nowhere and the attention would be divided. This is a very common thing in sibling rivalries, one sibling acting out because negative attention is better than no attention at all. What will come from this in this specific case is beyond words. This is not a normal sibling rivalry or normal behavior. This is not an excuse. It's just a piece of the very bizarre puzzle that is this creature we have named Clifford Olson the second. There are few words to describe him, except the words I will use in this podcast. He was a loner, someone who didn't make a lot of friends and was allegedly bullied in school before he himself became the bully. Cyclical abuse, cyclical trauma. We've talked about it, recurring theme. We know how it goes. He was known to be a loser and because of this and whatever other reasons he may have had, he dropped out when he was 16. He started working at a racetrack and would be jailed for the first time when he was only 17 years old. July 19th, 1957, he would be jailed for nine months on a charge of burglary. This would be the first of over 100 convictions that he would rack up over the next 24 years. 100 convictions! Possessions of stolen property, possession of firearms, forgery, false pretenses, fraud, impaired driving, theft, break and enter theft, armed robbery, escape from lawful custody, rape, buggery, gross indecency, obstruction of justice, parole violations, and to top it off, first degree murder. Because if you're going to jail for everything else, might as well feel that one too if you're Clifford Olson. He was never out of prison for more than a few months at a time after his arrest, and in these periods, he managed to cause incredible amounts of pain. So let's try and talk about some of these. This is going to be a wild ride, and honestly, this is going to be an intense one. If you haven't noticed, I'm giving you guys one more chance to turn away. He escaped from jail seven fucking times. Seven fucking times. That's either some talent, negligence, determination, or a mixture of all of the above. In 1965, he attempted to rob a supermarket and this didn't really go according to his plan. Police were called and dogs were on scene quickly. Good boy, police pup Rinty, barreled down into a blackberry bush where he pinned the suspect. Clifford's voice could be heard by authorities saying he couldn't come out because there was a dog on top of him. He received three and a half years for his crime, but he felt he only deserved a year. All right, buddy. All right. You, you're, you get enough chances. You, really. He pretended to be sick and three armed guards brought him out of the hospital. He managed to get away from them and dozens of officers fled to try and find him. Clifford managed to arm himself and managed to escape for an entire week before finally being captured. He had one close call, allegedly only missing officers by only seconds. Good job, guys. Good job. But he was found in the woods straddling the border of Washington and BC. He probably would have gotten away with the escape if he hadn't decided to threaten a group of teenagers with his gun just off the Pacific Highway crossing. This dude is not the smartest man. We will, we will quickly learn that he kind of just gets away with his shit through luck, charm, and hoping to God that he has enough leniency with the authorities. 
50 officers would initially flood the woods after the report of the threatened teenagers came in. 50 officers from a bunch of different districts and municipalities. I think even some from the states came in because it was the border of Washington. Clifford laid in the leaves and grass for three hours while the officers searched and waited for the dog team to come in. Rinty, the good boy, would be on scene searching, but he was not the one to find Clifford that fateful night. As soon as good boy Tiger got on scene, he brought officers right to Clifford. Clifford is said to have praised him as he came out of the leaves, saying he was a good boy who knew what he was doing. This is probably the only thing that I will agree with this piece of shit on. Clifford had been so well hidden that Tiger had to actually dig him up from under the leaves that his handler had actually basically been standing on top of. Clifford refused to move, apparently being afraid of the dog until he saw there were guns pointed at him and he had no other choice. His fear of dogs may have come from Rinty a year prior and good, good. I have a lot of animosity towards him and as a podcaster I probably shouldn't let that shine through but we're just gonna let it happen today we're just gonna let it ride because I think we'll all understand by the end of this if we don't already know about this case why it's there Clifford was known to be a predator in prison a fellow inmate would later come forward to speak of this but during one of his stays, he was known to repeatedly sexually assault a fellow inmate. The inmate was 17 at this time in 1974. In 1976, Clifford would be stabbed seven times by fellow inmates. At the time, the inmates had said it was because Clifford had been known around the prison as a snitch, something we'll kind of get into a little bit later. In reality, it was because Clifford had set his eyes on another young inmate that the other prisoners new was new to the prison. Clifford felt like he was at home as he turned this kid into a sex slave and his fellow inmates would get very tired of his shit very quickly. Clifford would survive the attack and be awarded $3,500 for his quote unquote moral and physical courage by the Saskatchewan Crimes Compensation Board in 1977. The inmates had not told the authorities why they stabbed him in reality. They told him it was because he was a snitch. So the officers would release Clifford. Officers looked at him as a con man and just kind of an egotistical asshole. An asshole, but not a sexual offender, according to the authorities. He would sexually assault a seven-year-old girl after this release and he would only be identified as her attacker four years later. He would be returned to prison on a robbery charge, and during this stay in prison, he would meet child murderer Gary Marcoux. Gary Marcoux had sexually assaulted and killed a nine-year-old girl, and authorities would end up putting him in the same cell as Clifford. This was done with the intention of Clifford coaching Gary into writing a confession that Clifford would hand over to the authorities. Clifford and Gary had become close friends, if you want to say that, and Gary had told Clifford that he needed an alibi for the night of his crimes. Clifford said he would do this if Gary wrote down everything about his crime so that Clifford could be careful not to say anything about those times to the authorities. This note, Clifford would hand over to the authorities. What a good buddy! This is believed to be when Clifford started to learn about his own urges and started to learn about himself in a way. The authorities were allowing Clifford to talk to another sex offender who had targeted a nine-year-old and it had been a very violent and brutal attack and he was learning about this and he was learning about the fact that he already had these urges. He'd already gone after a minor. He'd already been making sex slaves in prison. Clifford already had this kind of track record, even though the authorities weren't really looking at that. But it's believed that during this time, Clifford began to learn from Gary's mistakes and learn 
from Gary's plans and what Gary had done outside of the prison. And he would formulate his plans, Clifford would formulate his plans, on how not to get caught based on what the other man had done. That would make sense, except he didn't really do that great of a job of it. I'm not going to lie here. Because he was such a good little snitch, he would be released again. This fucker had way too many chances, but they released him again. This is when he would meet Joan Hale. Joan had recently left her husband and was looking for her true love. Her and Clifford found each other and something about one another just clicked. And they thought they found the one. Joan claimed her ex had been abusive, but people who had known him said he had been devastated and an amazing husband and father. She left her children with him as well, so that speaks for something I personally think. I'm not in any way one to victim blame. I know in so many situations that sometimes there could be a reason that this has to be done or things have to be done with regret. There's a reason I bring this specifically up with Joan and I will allow you to make your own opinions on Joan from the facts being laid out. I am only laying out facts so that we can understand things later on. I am not a victim blamer here. At first, Clifford was kind and charming, making her believe that she was his entire world. She would describe him as the most loving, adoring, sexual, and passionate man she had ever met. She was an incredibly in love, and for the first little while, Clifford's charms swooned her. It was during this time that his drug and alcohol habit really took hold of him, and he fell harder into his life of crime. Burglary and theft just wasn't enough for him anymore, I guess, and he already had assaulted at least one child, that's the seven-year-old, and gotten away with it. He'd gotten away with assaulting fellow inmates that were minors behind bars. This was supposed to be one of the most heinous acts, and he seemed to be able to get away with it, like, why not continue the sexual deviance? Spoiler alert, it's a terrible idea. After another release, Clifford would go to Edmonton and visit a friend named Mabel and her teenage daughter, Sherry. Sherry and Clifford would become close and she would take him to a party where he would meet her friend Liz and Liz's 16-year-old son. This kid was a little bit slow and just Clifford's type. He wouldn't remember much from the night Clifford offered him a job, bribing him with pill-filled champagne. The 16-year-old wouldn't remember much from that night beyond, quote, Olsen screwing him in the ass like a woman. It's also alleged that Mabel and Clifford were sleeping together at this time while Clifford was staying with them, and there was an amount of trust there. Even though Mabel would deny the allegation of the sleeping together, there was still proven to be a friendship there. At the very least, there was some trust there. Proven by the fact that when Sherry's father would send her mother Mabel some money, Mabel would then ask Clifford to pick that money up. He'd sent it for Sherry to be able to get some ballet lessons and she was like, all right, whatever, just ask Clifford to go pick it up. This was a terrible idea. He ran off with his new victim, the 16 year old boy that he had already just raped and the money that Sherry's father had sent to Mabel. Awesome, great. He would rape this young boy every day for weeks before returning him to Alberta and just dropping him off on a doorstep. Just dropping him off and running. November 17th, 1980. It was only a few months after his full release from prison that he decided to start his murderous spree. Christine Weller was a child living in a motor home with unemployed parents. Her mom was abused by her alcoholic parent and she was a child who felt isolated and alone because of this. Her family was constantly moving and she was bullied in school because she was always the new kid. She was known as a fearless tomboy and she decided one night to borrow her friend's bike to go window shopping at a local mall. She never came home. Clifford was out searching for Joan who had recently become depressed and left him when he spotted Christine instead. 
He would come up beside her and ask her to bring him to the unemployment office since he needed young workers. He could find Joan later and reel her back. Christine was now or never. He would flirt with Christine, telling her how she was so pretty and asking how she wasn't with her boyfriend. He would ask her about her life, asking about her mom's work and dad's work, asking about the life she had to see how missed she would be and how easy she would be to manipulate. She was offered a construction job and she climbed in the car, leaving her friend's bike behind on, I think it was leaning against a building at the end of an alley. As she climbed in the car and got comfortable, Clifford would offer her a beer, a celebratory drink to celebrate the fact that she now had a new job. She accepted and drank her beer as he told her the details of the job and put her at ease, even asking if she would want to phone her family and let them know where she was. And she would tell him that they didn't have a phone, just what he had been hoping for. This would become the typical spiel for Clifford and his most effective lure. He was also known to post job ads in his wife's church and at the time, the going rate for young people working was around five bucks an hour, and Clifford would offer ten to do some random job he could think of, usually cleaning a job site or washing windows or something along those lines. He would keep laminated business cards in his suit pocket, showing that he worked for a fake construction company. When these kids would accept, he would offer them a beer, and since these were young kids, what kid is going to pass up a beer from their new boss? This was the 80s, things were different, and these were kids and teenagers. And he specifically targeted people, young people, that he thought were naive or wouldn't know what he was doing. That would be too trusting. He knew what he was doing in that sense. So, when the kid wasn't looking, he would slip a little green pill into the drink. Or when they were feeling tired, there would be the excuse of it being a pick-me-up pill. I'm sure you guys have heard of like caffeine pills that I think they're commonly used in truckers. They'll use like uh, little caffeine pills so that they can keep driving. This is what Clifford would tell them they were, something to wake them up or something to prevent them from being drunk by dinner so that they could go home, be sober and see their parents. This pill was chloral hydrate, a common relaxant used before surgeries. The exact opposite. So back to Christine, he continued to give the girl beer, talking about how she should smoke marijuana with the other girls and asking if she already had. Christine would say yes, and he would give her some and keep this filed in his brain for later. He had her open up and the lonely, isolated girl would open up about a past sexual assault and open up about her life traumas. She was desperate for affection and for people to pay attention to her. He told her he was taking her to a house to pick up another one of his workers. He said they were picking up another young girl and picking up another car that had a car phone in it that she could use to call her parents. Clifford would continue to tell her it was earlier than it was and give her weed and alcohol moving from beer to vodka. He would promise to give her a few baggies of free weed and he would help her up, telling her they had to go to a different location to pick, to pick it up. And she would say, what about your other worker? He would say that he would just let the girl take the car overnight. And they would continue to walk to the door until Clifford would push Christine down to the ground and roll on top of her. He would kind of just roll around and ejaculate in his pants before he could actually assault her in the house. By this point, it was 10 o'clock at night, but he told her it was only 8.30 as he now had the inebriated girl leave with him and... He didn't feel he wanted to kill her at this point, but he wasn't sure about taking her home. Joan had decided to leave him at this point, yeah, but would she have returned to the apartment? He brought Christine to the apartment and left her in the car while he checked it out. He told her to keep her head down, not talk to anyone, just hang out in the car. Even though his wife still wasn't there, Clifford decided he wasn't going to risk keeping Christine there. At some point, a security guard would actually approach the predator as he was leaving and tell him that Joan was gone and that there was a girl in his car. Clifford brushed off the guard's worries as he explained that Christine was his niece and everything was fine. The guard was just checking and Christine's final hope would walk off into the depths of the garage. The two of them stopped for gas on River Road and Christine moved into the back seat to sleep. 
Clifford was so thankful that the 12-year-old was moving from passing out in passenger to passing out in the back. This would look really suspicious if he had a 12-year-old passed out and inebriated in his passenger seat. He could get away with a sleeping 12-year-old in his back seat. Cops would be less likely to pay mind to that if you really think about it. Just off of River Road was where he would take Christine to be sexually assaulted. He told her they would make love and she asked if she had to do it for the job. Clifford raped her vaginally and anally as she was barely conscious and when he was done, he decided he would bring her home, not wanting to kill her until he realized the car was stuck in the mud. He raped her anally again and full of self-pity, he strangled the unconscious girl for several minutes with her own shoelaces with her head against the car door. This unfortunately did not kill her the first time or the second time he tried as the girl turned blue. Filled with panic, he tried a third time and actually broke the shoelaces as Christine continued to breathe. In his mind, he couldn't do anything now and he couldn't leave her alive. He'd already tried to kill her, so he couldn't just let her live. He anally raped her again as the color returned to her face and he dragged the barely conscious girl deeper into the woods. He cried as he stood over her with his buck knife and prayed for forgiveness. When he was done praying, he felt the forgiveness was done. He was no longer doing anything wrong as he plunged the six inch blade into Christine's chest. He stabbed the girl's chest, the knife going to the hilt before pulling it out and stabbing her repeatedly and slashing her throat. He would throw her clothes and purse into the river after he cut them up and burned her IDs. He tried to get the car out of the mud, but when he failed, he cleaned it of his fingerprints, all of the evidence before abandoning attempts and calling a tow truck from a hotel he would walk to as he smoked his cigar. He stole Christine's jewelry and he would break the knife before chucking the pieces in the Fraser River. It took a full week before Christine's parents would file her missing, missing those crucial 24 hours and losing vital time. The police classified her as a runaway until poor Christine's body was found on the Fraser River dikes by a man walking his dog. Her remains were found on Christmas Day. She had 10 stab wounds, most notably two in her heart, four in her liver, and one in her groin. And there were superficial cuts on her throat from being slashed. This young girl was just looking for love and acceptance, and her one flaw was being too trusting. On April 10th, 1981, Stephen would be born to Joan and Clifford. I guess they reconciled at some point and he pulled the usual manipulative bullshit that a serial killer with a wife will do. With the baby's birth, the family moved into a public housing complex in Coquitlam. This home would become his base of sadistic operation as well. The relationship between Joan and Clifford would be good until she began to question his alcohol and pill use, having him blow up for hours and hours the first time. He cornered her, making her frightened and apparently feel helpless, but she did not leave him the next day, assuming she had just touched a very raw, sensitive nerve, and she thought if she didn't continue asking about the pills or the alcohol, it would be fine. But the behavior escalated so that he was blowing up every time she made a comment that he deemed negative about him. Unfortunately, this was the real Clifford, not the one that she had previously known. Colleen Denault was a short and shy girl who was walking home on April 16, 1981, just six days after Clifford's baby was born. The new father rolled up and decided to offer the teenager a ride the rest of her way. While Colleen was in the car, she was given the usual spiel. When Colleen drank the mixture of chloral hydrate and beer, she felt how any of us would feel, woozy and helpless. He drove her to a forest near Swanish and raped her anally and vaginally. When he was done assaulting the girl, he tried to inject air into an artery to create an embolism. An embolism can be created by a lot of things, but this is specifically an air embolism. This is when air gets into a vein or artery and prevents blood from getting into whatever point of the body the blockage lands in. Typically, embolisms are caused by um, blood clots that are in the veins or arteries, but this one specifically, like I said, is an air embolism. Typically, when it's administered in this way, typically, air embolisms happen by accident, but if they do not happen by accident, the killer is attempting to block blood flow from the heart. 
This is supposed to mimic a heart attack, but clearly it's not very reliable, and I would imagine it's pretty painful to go through. When the attempts didn't work for Clifford, he drove the two of them to White Rock. He anally and vaginally raped Colleen again while promising her he would take her home after she woke up. He then walked her down a trail in the woods when he was done and told her there would be a house down the trail to clean up in. He told her to retrieve the key from on top of a stump and the girl complied, walking ahead of her rapist and reaching above her head to grab the key that wasn't there. Clifford liked her and debated not killing her, but decided against it as he beat her skull with a hammer until she died. He would bury her under trees and leaves, throwing her shoes in a ditch. He would immediately go to pick up his wife and son from an appointment after this, not wanting Joan to be angry with him. What he didn't realize was that there had been an inch wide stripe of blood down the front of his shirt. Nothing came of this, but the sighting would be remembered later on. A few days later, Clifford spotted Darren Johnsrud. The boy was on an errand on April 21st, 1981. This was just two weeks after his 16th birthday when he was grabbing the dry cleaning and some stuff from the local shopper's drug mart. Clifford rolled up beside him and gave him the typical seal of a job and Darren accepted as he climbed into Clifford's rental car. Clifford had told him the workplace commonly smoked weed and drank alcohol and let loose, something that appealed to the teenager that came from a broken home. Darren had run away a few times in his life before this, as he tried to run away from his own life's turmoils, which would lead to investigators struggling to file his report. Clifford drove Darren toward Agassiz, and as soon as Darren was losing his consciousness, Clifford pulled over into a field and raped him repeatedly. This was not the first time Darren had been sexually assaulted, and the boy would tell Clifford this in the middle of the assault. In the midst of assaulting the boy, Clifford would feign outrage at what had been done previously to him. When he was done with his assaults on Darren, he would lead him to a river where he would beat him with his trusty hammer. The police refused to file Darren as a missing person for the first 48 hours. Weeks would pass before the family would hear about their son's death, and this was through the police calling the family and requesting access to the dental records and to ask about Darren's clothing. Authorities would call back to say the remains they had recovered were not Darren's, and then called back a third time to say that, yeah, it had been in fact Darren's, they'd made a mistake. Darren's mother would recall how she fell to the floor just bawling at the news, and the family would feel deep trauma over how they were treated and how they found out about Darren's death. The entire family was questioned about it, including his nine-year-old sister. Because of the way the investigation was going, Clifford had lots of time to just keep on doing as he do. Darren had only lived two blocks away from him, and the police were so close, but they had to follow protocol and interrogate the family. They went way too hard on this one. They should not have had to interrogate a nine-year-old over this. During this time, Clifford would assault a five-year-old girl he was babysitting for a friend. He would not be convicted for her attack as the authorities couldn't find enough evidence against him. In the end, he would tell them he had simply been putting cream on the baby's, quote, pee-pee because she had a rash that had been making her uncomfortable in the first place. So he was let off for this, and he would then go to 16-year-old Sandra Wolfsteiner. She disappeared in mid-May of the same year, 1981. She was last seen hitchhiking through Urban Langley. She lived with her sister and was from a broken home, trying to get a job that would allow her to get a place of her own. Clifford jumped on the opportunity, and this made the girl suspicious in the first place. She questioned him, but he just reeled her in more and more with each and every one of her questions. He would end up convincing her to give him all of her money in her bank account to help her get a car. She would give him the $1,000 she had in her account in cash, and then he would deposit into his account later. He would use this $1,000, and he would then make up the difference and help her buy a car with his credit. And... As she was doing this, he would talk about how much he loved his wife and talk about how he would bring her to meet his wife and try and lure her into a sense of security that way. After this, he drove them to Cultus Lake and he drugged her the way he did all the others. Clifford had Sandra get out of the car and walk down a trail. He beat her in the head with a hammer and she tried to fight back. She called him a bastard until she was unconscious and she held her arms up and she tried to get away. It was at this time that he raped her anally and vaginally. 
When he was done, he grabbed her purse to retrieve the money and found out she had scammed him. There was only $15 in the bag. He was enraged. He was pissed. He was livid and glad. He would later say he was glad he had killed her as he covered the still breathing girl with branches and twigs. She was still breathing, but with the amount of brain damage received from the assault, she would not have recovered anyway, doctors said later. It's just incredibly heartbreaking knowing that she continued to suffer longer as he drove away and she laid under the twigs and leaves in those woods on a mid-May night, which in British Columbia, it's not the warmest. It's pretty chilly. As awful as it sounds with the brain damage she had, I kind of hope that she was unaware of where she was when she died because it just would have added salt into the wound. It, it's just horrendous to think that she was still aware and in pain and I just I hope that her suffering was lessened as much as it could have. After poor Sandra was 13 year old Ada Court. Ada was known as a really good kid and she disappeared in June. She was waiting for a bus after babysitting and earning some extra money. She'd been babysitting in the same apartment complex that Clifford lived in and that proved to be the perfect opportunity for the pervert to strike. She climbed in the car as he offered to drive her home so she wouldn't have to walk such a long way and take the bus. As he drove her, he gave her his typical speech and drugged her as he drove her to a mine shaft. He would fondle the girl in the secluded mine shaft before he began to make her walk. She was so tired, full of beer and pills and having worked a long night the night before and just having been assaulted he had to help her stumble before making her walk into the trees and beating her head in with the hammer. After physically assaulting her, he decided to sexually assault her again. He anally raped her and vaginally raped her before covering her with branches and leaves and going back to the car. His car was stuck in the mud again. This dude had not learned his lesson about cars in the mud for fuck's sake. So now, because he was stuck, he went back to Ada and realized the girl was still breathing. He uncovered her and raped her again before covering her up and burning her possessions beside her. Her cause of death would later be found to be strangulation. Clifford's entire life revolved around his pedophilic urges and violence, but also around his family. He shoplifted, burglarized, and would actually occasionally work in construction. Shocking, I know. He would do legal things to provide for his shitty behaviors and for his family. He was drinking heavily and doing drugs on top of his other criminal acts, but also trying to provide for his wife and son. Clifford would also frequently rent and return cars to different rental car dealers. He didn't hold on to the same car for long and this helped to cover up his identification, but I would imagine costs would rack up quickly doing this. Less than two weeks after the death of Ada, on July 2nd, Clifford would see his next victim. Cruising on his bike down a Richmond road only a few blocks from where Christine Weller had gone missing, Simon Partington was on his way to visit his friend. He was a shy, blonde-haired nine-year-old and Clifford said, that's the one I want today, that's the one. This would actually be the turning point in the case. This little boy would not have run away. He loved his family and his family loved him. It would kick the investigation into high gear. Clifford offered Simon a beer and the little boy would at first deny the drink before Clifford would offer him a pill to prevent him from getting drunk. Simon would accept it, and as he began to slip into the haze of inebriation, Clifford pulled over and raped him in a field. He started with the guise of sun tanning, so he would strip off the little boy's shirt, and then he stripped off his own shirt, and then that led into stripping him down until Simon... He couldn't really fight back since he was nine years old to begin with, but he couldn't fight back anymore because of the inebriation, and he would be raped. Clifford would stab him with a buck knife and strangle him with a belt. Before this, Clifford had so far been spreading his killings out all over the Lower Mainland and changing up his way of killing. This made it difficult for them to be connected as the police departments did not have the same communication as we do today. This on top of renting cars, committing his crimes in remote areas, and choosing the naive, young, and vulnerable, so far he'd been doing okay at covering his tracks. Simon Partington was found to be strangled to death and found in a shallow grave in a peat bog between two arms of the Fraser River. 
It's only been seven months since Clifford started this rape and murder spree. He's not done yet. If anything, his ego is growing. He keeps getting away with this, and to his knowledge, he's not even being looked at as a suspect. He's worked with the authorities while in prison as an informant, and he was on their side, supposedly. This is buying him more time. A week after Simon went missing, Clifford was again on the prowl. He just would not stop. Or maybe he could not stop. I don't know which of the two it was, but I really wish he would or could have. But with the loss of Simon, Clifford began to edge onto the police's radar. Clifford was becoming known for sodomizing young boys as survivors would come forward, and he now had a history of allegations of molesting children. His clock was ticking and seconds counted. Judy Cosma was a talented gymnast and a dedicated student. She was known as a clean-cut, wholesome kid who even at age 14 knew she wanted to become a nurse when she graduated school. This dream would be taken away from her. She already had a part-time job at McDonald's and she was on her way to her friend's house to get help with applying to Wendy's for another part-time job. Clifford had been a regular customer that Judy unfortunately recognized from his frequent visits to the McDonald's she worked at. Clifford had his friend Randy Ludlow with him. Randy would later testify in court against Clifford to help put him behind bars. Randy could remember Clifford calling Judy over to the car after catching sight of her leaving a phone booth in New Westminster. He told her to hop in the car and she agreed with full thanks. She was so happy to get a ride. It would have taken forever for her to bus from where she was to where she was going. It was across the city and she was so glad to have someone to take her there. After getting in the car, Clifford offered Judy a beer. She took it, drinking it in the back and making small talk with the two men until they arrived in Richmond. They showed up too early for Judy to either go to her interview or meet with her friend, so Clifford and Randy decided to take her with them to go get some more beer. She knew Clifford pretty well, she thought, so she was on board with it. Randy would claim that Clifford wanted to impress Judy and gave him a big wad of cash in front of her, only to take it back from him when the girl wasn't looking. This is a 14-year-old girl and an over 40-year-old man. It was after they got in the car again that Clifford would do the job offer speech to poor Judy. She was a girl desperate for a second job. If she could get one double the going rate, like Clifford was offering, then she would only need one or she could make more money than she already was thinking she could make. That's, wow, that's perfect. That's amazing. That's exactly what she's looking for. She was his perfect victim. He came back with rum and coke and offered her some, and she said she didn't want any, but with pressure accepted it. Clifford told Randy to pour it, and he poured her one with no rum, but she pretended it was strong. Clifford seemed pleased and handed her the green pills to wake her up. After this, he stopped by his own apartment to grab some things. Randy would later testify this was the only time that Judy seemed upset. She was panicking a bit and anxious, and he thought it was because she was going to miss her job interview and she was just so young. He wiped the tears from her eyes and told her it would be okay, but she immediately snapped into being okay again as Clifford returned. He said she snapped into being the old Judy. Clifford would take Randy to the Lougheed Mall in Maple Ridge, and when Randy would ask, he would be told that his friend had dropped Judy off safely in Richmond. This was not what happened, as I'm sure you've guessed. Clifford brutally raped and murdered her. He had the hammer and the buck knife on the window ledge above her head as he did so, and as she was passed out, he had the tools poised against her forehead to be used. But he would decide against it so as not to make a mess in the car. She woke up again and said she was scared of not getting home on time before she passed out again, and he punched her in the stomach and her head. Failing to rouse her, he raped her anally, then vaginally again. He dragged the still unconscious girl from the car and flung her over a cliff, and then climbed down to fondle her some more afterwards, because he decided he still wasn't done. During this, he realized she was still breathing, and he stabbed the knife through her neck. He raped her again, before deciding he had to be sure she was dead. Just to be sure he didn't fuck it up, he decided to stab her 19. You heard me. 19 times. He covered her with twigs and branches and just left. He would leave her body in Lake Weaver, just outside of Agassiz, and 20 kilometers away from where Darren's remains had been found. In her purse, she had her address book, and Clifford decided to take this. Deciding over the next little while, he would go through the phone numbers and call each of them. 
Some calls he would just breathe on the other end of the line, and some he would threaten them. He would say he would come for them and their friends next. This was the 80s. The police couldn't really trace the calls the way they can today, so even if they had them, it would have been a lot harder back then, and honestly, there really wasn't a lot they could have done. The day after leaving Judy in Lake Weaver, Clifford took his family on vacation to California until the 21st. They spent time in Disneyland. There's no concrete evidence he had victims in the States, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. This is a theme park full of kids. He's a sexual predator who targeted kids within an age range of proven 5 to 17. No, he didn't murder the five-year-old, but he did molest her. So she's the youngest one that I found proof of. So this is the exact age that is in Disneyland. I wouldn't be surprised if there were victims wherever he went. I only hope that he didn't, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Allegedly, while on this vacation, he held his son Stephen under some water until pulling his son from danger in just the nick of time. Joan would also leave the infant with his father for a short period of time and come home to find the baby screaming. She went to investigate and found superficial stab wounds on the baby. She still continued to leave Stephen or Clifford the third. I found evidence of both names. I'm not sure which one it was. Doesn't really matter. Um, either way, he was attacking this child and Joan was still leaving him with his father. And there is now allegations of child molestation that Joan attended the hearings in support of Clifford, like the one where he would describe putting cream on the baby's pee-pee. She was there with him, with Stephen in her arms. There were witnesses that saw them leaving all three of them together. So even though she knew full well of all of this happening, she would leave her baby with him. I recognize full well that Joan was abused, but yikes. So they got home on the 21st, and Raymond King Jr. would go missing on July 23rd. He was out job hunting, and he never came home. This was the perfect target for Clifford, and this unfortunate kid likely would have heard the offer of an on-the-spot hire of a great job and jumped on it. Ray King Jr. had a habit of going to the Canada Manpower Youth Employment Center so often that the staff inside knew him. He wanted his first real job and the summer vacation that had just started was his perfect opportunity. His father had unfortunately just had two cancer surgeries and though he was back at work, money was still really tight and Ray Jr. desperately wanted to help out the family. He was known as a really good kid. He always wanted to help out. He was incredibly talented, according to his dad. His dad said he played f soccer, football. He was a good skier. He was very artistic. And his dad said he really thought that his son could have made a living as an artist. But this kid would never get that chance. Ray Jr. did as he always did, chaining up his bike behind the building before heading inside. On his way from the back of the building to the entrance, Clifford lured him over, promising him work that, of course, Ray Jr. grabbed the opportunity. The kid would climb into Clifford's car of the day and the two would drive away. The anxiety in Raymond's stomach, I can imagine growing as they drove down Highway 7 off towards Harrison Mills and Weaver Lake. Clifford drove down the bumpy back roads until he found a spot where he was happy. This kid was off his mind high on the drugs Clifford had given him. He had no idea where he was as Clifford raped him. Clifford would tell him he was a quote-unquote better fuck than most girls and Raymond would reply to him, you're a great guy Cliff. This kid had no idea what was happening to him. He had no idea where he was. There's a piece of me that is kind of thankful. He was so out of his mind on drugs because he would not know what was happening as Clifford pulled out a nail and his hammer and placed the tip of his nail against the boy's skull. Clifford said he relished the feeling of playing God before using the hammer to plunge the nail into Raymond's skull. It went all the way in and he tried to get it out with 
at first his fingers and then the claw side of the hammer. He would continuously ask Raymond how he was doing, how he was feeling. He would assault the boy again with a nail in his brain and continue to ask how he was doing. Raymond tried to fight back through the second sexual assault, but he was too weak for the attempts to matter. Clifford would throw him off of a cliff and throw large boulders at him to ensure his death. He buried him in dirt, logs, and branches, and then drove away. He logged over 400 kilometers on his rental car, and he tried to return it the next day, raising some eyebrows. There was an attendant there who Clifford had offered a job as well, but she turned him down, which raised a few red flags because she said that he would only come into that specific rental car office when she was working there, and it creeped her out. So this was another thing to tack onto his profile. Sigrun Arndt, Arndt was visiting a cousin in Coquitlam from Germany when she caught the eye of Clifford in a local pub July 25th, 1981. She was known as a smart girl that her family had never known to hitchhike or get into a stranger's car before. Clifford insisted that he would show her the Canadian way of things, that he would be her Canadian guide. Her father would read her diary after learning of her death, reading the passages of her travels in Canada. While she loved all of the travels and experiences she had, she mostly fell in love with the friendliness open-heartedness and eagerness to help local people. This is what her father thinks contributed to her getting into Clifford's car. He thinks that she just fell in love with Canada and she saw all this friendliness and all of this open-heartedness that Canada had to offer and she just thought all of the people were like this and no one could be bad here. She was excited to go drinking at the different pubs, meeting construction workers Clifford had sold stolen tools to. He gave her a, quote, authentic Canadian experience, using the excuse to hide behind as he fed her more alcohol slipped with pills. He would say that it was Canadian tradition to drink with your um, guest, so she felt the need to drink another that he put pills in in the car as they drove away from the pub and his friends. The girl would fall asleep as they drove to Richmond and he led her to where he claimed he had a trailer that he had to get tools from and took her into a bog. She was stumbling before he bludgeoned her skull, proceeding to rape her. As he raped her, he would feel the back of her head to feel if there was a puncture wound. He said he felt blood, but there was no feeling like the skull had actually shattered. He continued to ask how she was feeling and how her head was doing, and it would prove she had no memory of actually being smacked in the first place. He continued to rape her before he asked her to pray for him when he was done. He made her agree to pray for his forgiveness and made her repeat that she was a sinner and that she would also ask for the Lord's forgiveness. This girl would have been so just fucked up from her injuries and the alcohol and the drugs that she likely had no idea what she was doing before she was murdered with three more blows to the head. He chucked her into a ditch and would have to climb down to step on her so that she would actually sink because the water was so deep the remains were floating and he didn't want it to float on the surface of the water. He actually wanted to submerge her and hide the remains. Her remains would be found 400 yards away from where Simon's had been and only the day after his had been recovered. Her family would receive the news long distance through Sigrun's aunt, who was living in Vernon at the time. July 27, 1981, Terry Lynn Carson was a 15-year-old girl. She was not a naive kid and it took some convincing to get her into the car, but when she was in, she was in his clutches. He gave her alcohol and offered her the job offer that she couldn't refuse. Terry's mom was struggling to make ends meet and this offer was too good to be true. When she started to mention to Clifford that she was getting drunk, he would tell her to look in the glove compartment for the wake-up pills. He told her to take a couple and she said if he said so. He replied that he did since he was the boss. She took a couple of the pills but would tell him she didn't think they were working. He would tell her to take three more, and she would ask him to explain what they did again. He would reply that they counteracted the alcohol. Clifford would then take three of the pills from her and pretend to take them to prove that they were safe. 
He kept them under his tongue until he could spit them into his pocket. This was all the convincing that he needed to do as she took another three pills. As she passed out, he would throw her glasses out the window and she slept in the back seat. He pulled into a gas station in Hope and he tried to shake her awake. It was hot as hell outside and she would not wake up. He tried to shake her, but when this didn't work, he looked around the parking lot and when he realized it was a ghost town, he fondled her breasts. He moved his hands down her stomach to her butt and there was no reaction. As there was no reaction, there was still no one around and he unzipped her jeans and slipped his hand inside them. As she still didn't wake up, he would find this his moment. He said he felt a sense of hurried urgency as he slid down her pants and his own roughly sodomizing her in an attack that really only lasted a few seconds. An attack that happened in the middle of a gas station parking lot that no one noticed. Something to sate his demons until he could truly have his way with her. She stayed in the exact same position as she was redressed and laid in the back seat again. Clifford would begin to panic as he ran errands with her still motionless in the back seat. How would he explain a drunk, stoned, and passed out teenager in his back seat if the police caught him? He hurriedly drove down Highway 401 until he found a spot that would do in his panicked state. He pulled a blanket out of his trunk after pulling into a secluded clearing in the woods off the highway. He followed a dirt path hoping to find a cabin and when he was unable to, he just decided, fuck it, this is where he was going to do it. He tried to wake her up again, calling her sweetheart as he shook her. She groaned, letting him know she wasn't dead yet, but she didn't move. He was impatient and threw her arm over his shoulders, dragging her to the blanket where he could lay her face down and stare at her before he stripped her. He undressed himself, leaving his wallet and watch in the car before turning to the still unconscious girl. He raped her vaginally and then anally before picking up a screwdriver. He liked Terry Lynn and he had described her as a quote, beautiful fuck later on. Ugh. He picked up the hammer and the screwdriver and rested the tip of the screwdriver on the teenager's forehead. He looked at her a while, just admiring how she didn't move and enjoying the control he had over her, before using the hammer to plunge the screwdriver into the girl's skull. Clifford would later talk about how he had been shocked there was no resistance and he tried to get the screwdriver out, but it was totally stuck. He tried wiggling it, which ended up causing the handle to break, and it left the six inches of screwdriver in Terry's head. This did not kill the girl. He would later claim she felt no pain and felt this was a way to excuse what he had done. He said it was okay because he didn't hurt her while he killed her. He thought this somehow made what he did somewhat a little more forgivable. Terry was still alive as Clifford felt her forehead and found there was still a little bit of the metal poking out. He tried to use his fingers to get it out and when that didn't work, he tried to use the claw side of the hammer, just like he had with Raymond Jr. Terry was still breathing and he would ask her if she could hear him and how she was feeling. He had a deep curiosity for a girl he would allegedly later refer to as one of his experiments. She didn't respond to his questions, but something in him snapped and he needed her again. He anally raped her a second time, not caring if she was alive or dead at any point. She would reach back and try to push him off and Clifford was just in shock that Terry was still alive and coming back too. This sick fuck is raping a girl with a screwdriver in her head and he's just remembering how much shock he feels that she's coming back to. She is not unconscious and that she's just coming back to life. Wow, this sick fuck. Unfortunately, this poor girl's suffering just would not end and she was dragged to a nearby creek for Clifford to force her head underwater. He would slip multiple times and have to adjust himself as he stood on Terry's neck to keep her head under the water. He was watching the bubble stream come from her mouth to the surface of the water, waiting for it to stop, and when it did, he just waited for a while after that to really ensure she was dead, because he really seemed to suck at killing people, even though he did it a lot within a very short period of time. He would then throw her off of a cliff and throw twigs and leaves on her to just cover her up that way. He stole Terry's jewelry, a necklace, earrings, and a ring on her finger. He cut up and threw her clothing and possessions into the Fraser River. The only thing he kept was her ID and purse because he wanted to burn these. 
He did the same thing to his own clothes and he disposed of the hammer, the handle of the screwdriver, and the knife he had used to cut things up in different places before he went home to bed with his wife. I'm gonna slide in here with some speculation of my own. I'm not a psychiatrist or anything professional. The most schooling I have is one year of criminology way back in high school and the internet, but there are some parallels I find here to Jeffrey Dahmer. This is pure speculation, and I don't know if anyone else has come up with the parallels. I'm sure someone else has, but when I'm doing my research for the true crime stories that I share on my channels, I am trying to avoid other true crime people because I want to come up with my own opinions beforehand, before I find other people's opinions and find other parallels. I want to stick to the true facts and I want to stick to those things before I look into those kind of things and test my own brain out, as well as come up with my own opinions for the channel. But anyway, I'm sidetracking. If anyone else has come up with that, please link to me in the YouTube comments on my channel or in your, the Apple reviews, anything you can. I would love to read some more about this. But from the way Clifford kept stabbing into the brains of his victims, and he would allegedly later refer to them as his experiments, I kind of think he was trying to make his own sex slave or find control of these kids. I personally believe he was trying to create this for a few reasons. He may have simply been sadistic and was curious about the pain they would be in and the curiosity of what would happen likely not having known someone would survive these injuries until the first time he did it with Raymond. He would feel for the puncture wounds while he raped his still living victims as we know with Sigrun, despite the hammer blows. I think he was looking to see what damage he needed to inflict to create the state that he wanted. I think it started with the shut up and submit in prison that he had and evolved to a drugged catatonic state that he would get his victims into later. He showed a strange, kind of weird amount of remorse when he cried over his victims, the remorse that would be erased when he prayed. His remorse was from his belief that he would be punished by God, and when he prayed, he was being forgiven. As long as he was forgiven, his mind was wiped clean. This, in his words, was why he chose the Catholic religion, because you could get away with anything. You could do anything, and as long as you believed and prayed, they would forgive you for it. I really think he wanted to create a single catatonic victim he could keep alive and see if he could sate his urges that way. Keep one at home and maybe he wouldn't hurt others, but maybe he just enjoyed knowing he was fucking them up and knowing how they were doing. Again, this is all speculation, I'm not professional or anything, and I have no proof, but it's almost creepy how similar it is to Jeffrey Dahmer. Like, Dahmer commit his murders exactly a decade after in the States. Maybe there was an inspiration here. But enough about Jeffrey, because we're supposed to be focusing on my great white north of Canada. Police would begin to follow Clifford, and his time was running out. A firefighter would intervene with him trying to pick up a girl from a fire station, and this turned out to be an undercover officer. Tail would only stop when they believed Clifford already knew that the authorities were there, and they had to do some budget cuts. They'd failed to meet the criteria for a warrant on Clifford's arrest, and they thought the tale was kind of a waste of time if Clifford knew it was there, and they weren't getting the evidence they needed anyway. Clifford decided to try and pin the crimes on Randy, the one that had been there with uh, the abduction of Judy. So Clifford decided he was going to blame the crimes on Randy and kill him so Randy couldn't actually tell the truth. He'd already seen Judy being picked up, and he was there when Judy was being picked up, so witnesses would have seen Randy and Judy being together, so he was kind of an ideal loose end to pin it on and target. July 30th, 1981, 17-year-old Louise Chartrand would be the last of Clifford Olson's victims. She had hitchhiked part of the way to her waitressing job, and after being dropped off in mission, she decided to go get some cigarettes. She was the youngest of seven and had just moved to Maple Ridge, a small town in the Fraser Valley from Quebec with her family. Louise was known as a loving, kind, and generous girl. She was only 10 minutes away from her workplace when Clifford caught sight of her on the way to his lawyer's office. The pair headed out towards Squamish, and at some point, Clifford would pull over to anally rape her in the back seat of the car. He would continue driving when he was done, and they would arrive at a gravel pit somewhere outside of Squamish. On the way there, he actually stopped at an RCMP office to pick up a confiscated gun with Louise in the back. 
He was unable to pick up the weapons since the officer in charge of the confiscated weapons actually wasn't in the building, but he didn't get caught with the girl in his car either. The girl that the RCMP officers would have definitely known was not Clifford's wife. But again, even if they saw Louise, Clifford was, in their eyes, not a sexual predator. A sleazy con man with a violent streak, but not a sexual predator. How wrong they fucking were. Clifford convinced this captive girl to allow him to have sex with her so that he could secure her job. She showed worry about getting pregnant and he promised her that she wouldn't. Nice, yeah, she's not going to because of what you're planning on doing to her. He put his knife on the car roof and the hammer within reach as he raped her. He did so three times over the course of the evening until he thanked her for letting him, quote, love her. She countered with questioning if he was a rapist. The question would tip him over the edge, make him angrier and angrier as time went on and he could stew on it. He gave her another drink and told her he wasn't a rapist as she slowly seemed to calm down. He walked away for a moment and she saw the hidden knife. She grabbed it and Louise slashed at her attacker. She knew what was going to happen to her and she had accepted it, but she wasn't going to go down without at least attempting to fight back. Clifford kept insisting he wouldn't kill her until this point, but as he took the knife from the girl, he pressed it to her throat, asking again why she had fought him and why it would make sense to kill her. She just knew in her gut and she was right. He threatened her before letting her go and anally raping her again. After he was done, he allowed her to go to the bathroom and while he allowed her to do this, he bashed her in the back of the head with the hammer. He hit her with enough force he had to pry the hammer out of her skull. He was angry as he drove away from the covered body, blaming the government and the justice system for allowing him to become the monster he was, for allowing him out of prison in the first place, and for allowing him to continue to get away with what he was doing, for putting him with Gary and allowing him to create these ideas in the first place, I guess. He never blamed himself, is what I'm saying. He basically blamed everyone else that he could possibly blame except for himself. Clifford was thrilled as he saw his story in the newspaper. He visited Alberta for a while and no one knows what he was doing there. I can only hope he had no victims, but again, I don't know and I wouldn't put it past this sick fuck. He had returned to his old hunting grounds of BC and unfortunately for him, a lot of surveillance. The RCMP caught Clifford drinking with a group of teenage girls and the whole group was actually pissed at being stopped. But the police would end up booking him for break and enter as well as robbery. The girls would be let go as they were obviously not involved. As the authorities searched Clifford's car, they finally found a piece of evidence to tie him to the crimes. Judy's notebook was still in the car. They searched Clifford with this information and Clifford shot back that he could show the officers where Randy had hidden the bodies, but he wanted to be put in the psych ward instead of jail. He didn't want to be assaulted or attacked again, but you know, it's okay for him to do it to kids. It's okay for him to fuck up little children and take their lives, but he doesn't want to get hurt in prison. Boo hoo, Clifford, boo hoo. Who am I? Whatever. The initial search of Clifford's home proved no more evidence towards the case, but the RCMP could not make the deal that Clifford wanted. It had to be a judge or a psychiatrist to admit him to a ward, not the officers. They would tell Clifford this, and the man did not give a shit, as he was insistent that Randy had done these crimes and that it had never been him at all. Of course, the Mounties allowed Clifford to think they believed him. They wanted him to show them one body as a show of good faith, but Clifford would not budge. The spoiled little fuckwit just wanted his way because he's not used to being told no. Eventually, he would agree to bring the authorities to each body for a total sum of $10,000 each to be paid to his wife and son. He had some care in his heart to make sure that they would be supported while he was in prison. Clifford originally said he wanted $100,000 for the confessions and the bodies in a lump sum, but the decision would be made to do it in $10,000 per body, confession, and all that mixed together. The agreement was given the approval, and he gave them Christine for free as a show of good faith. The RCMP had already found four bodies and were looking for seven. Because they already had located four, they offered Clifford $30,000 in total for information regarding those four murders. Clifford's lawyer actually backed out of this, refusing to involve himself in this case because 
He thought this deal was just ridiculous and unnecessary. Clifford would formally be charged with 11 counts of murder. He was segregated from the other prisoners and he had a hell of a time in prison. He was given a shirt by guards that had baby killer written on it. Prisoners would throw cups of urine at him, spit at him, and guards just didn't care. The sleeves and the buttons of his clothes that he was supposed to wear to court, they were torn out, and guards would throw lit cigarettes at him. He would be denied phone calls and visits from Joan, and when she was allowed to visit, she would be harassed by other inmates. And even though the guards told these inmates to stop, they wouldn't, and there wasn't much the guards could do beyond warn the inmates because they weren't actually physically hurting her, they were just threatening her. Clifford did not think of himself as crazy, but he was eager to try and get an insanity plea. He was analyzed by a psychologist and found to be a profound psychopathic personality whose capacity to create victims is such as to have effect on the structure of civilized society. That is a quote. I did not say quote before I read it, but it is a quote. He scored a 38 out of 40 on a psychopathy checklist. January 11th, 1982, the courtroom was filled with the press for the initial sentencing, but only two mothers were able to show up. More family members of victims would come forward after Clifford had been put behind bars, but they had already been through so much torment from this man that they just couldn't face him in court at this time. The few who would show up would glare at Clifford, pretty understandably, I'd say, as the man wiped away his tears and expressed fake regret to the slayings of their children. The two mothers cried in their seats amongst the reporters and the photographers that just feverishly tried to get as much information as they could as Clifford pled guilty and the deal came out of the shadows. Until this, it had been top secret and this is when it would become public. Outrage filled the courtroom and would fill the entire country over the fact that Clifford would be given money for his crimes. The Mounties would argue that they needed all of the information they could possibly get to secure the conviction, but there is firm belief in the country's public that there would have been plenty of evidence with the four bodies they already had. Plus all of the allegations and the list and list and list of over a hundred convictions that Clifford already had. They probably would have been able to tie some circumstantial evidence out of that as well as some actual evidence from the bodies that they had. The lawyer that did stand by Clifford's side would be sent death threats in the mail. One would be covered in feces, he would recall, because of his involvement. There was a lot of anger towards this deal, and I have to say I understand. It wasn't the lawyer's fault. He was just doing his job because the police had already decided they were going to do this. He was just there for finalizing. But the anger I understand, even if it should not have been aimed towards his lawyer. There was so much evidence with the four bodies they had, and honestly, the locations of the other bodies were not too far from the ones that had already been discovered. They just needed to work a little harder in my opinion and they likely would have found most of these kids without having to fork over a hundred grand into the pockets of a murderer's family and let him have yet another victory to stroke his ego. After the deal was made, he was brought out into the cranberry bogs and the forests, probably mentally reliving his crimes as he showed the authorities where the last of the bodies would be. While in prison, he would send letters to the family one being sent to Darren's parents with graphic detail of what had happened to their son. He would send Christmas cards and pornographic imagery, drawings, and he would just torment these people, which is a massive reason so many of them have stayed so far out of the media. Clifford would write a book that would be smuggled out of prison and published. I did not purchase it for my research. I know I have a lot of his quotes in here, but I found other people who had, and I did my thing and I went into reviews and I found free websites who were not giving any profits towards this family. This family has profited enough from the pain that this man has inflicted. This man got away with way too much and he gave himself his own serial killer name. He called himself the Beast of BC, which is why I have opted to call him what the media called him, which is the rental car killer. He can go fuck himself, but he might enjoy that too much. When Clifford turned 65 in 2005, he would begin receiving a pension. So he's already gotten $100,000 for his slayings, 
Now he's getting a pension, which would be $1,100 a month to be sent to his wife and son so that they would get to live on this money. Joan would claim she never saw any of the hundred grand because of legal fees Clifford had caused them to suffer. But I really cannot see a trial that only lasted a few days because of the deal they had created already costing this much. Now she's receiving this pension and the book. And just to put an extra fuck you cherry on top of this little Sunday to these poor victims, Clifford decided to begin selling memorabilia online. Someone would come in and have him sign things like a copy of his fake construction card that he would give to his victims. They would smuggle these out of prison and sell it to lo for ludicrous amounts online and the family would get a cut. So they were just profiting and profiting and profiting off of these crimes. So Clifford would be doing this as well as making videos in prison as well as writing this book. So every time he did something like released a new video or wrote this book and released that or when the memorabilia thing came out, he had his name just plastered all over the news and the poor victims' families had to suffer through this on top of four separate parole hearings. In Canada, an inmate can apply for the Faint Hope Clause, which basically means that if they have received a life sentence, they can apply for parole after 15 years. Even if they're sentenced to no possibility of parole, they can apply for this so that this sentencing can be reconsidered. Currently, the Faint Hope Clause does not cover someone who has committed multiple murders, but Clifford was able to apply before the rules were set. Only a few months to be exact, which is really unfortunate. He applied in August and the rules were changed in January of that year. Clifford was the same as he was in prison as he was out of it, a boastful, overconfident asshole. He would come to authorities and try to convince them that he had committed 30 murders and he would convince them to take him on trips to find these bodies. Despite none ever showing up, they would just keep believing him and they would keep taking him on these trips. I genuinely just think he was playing games with these guys and seeing how far he could go. He enjoyed playing with them and wanted to see if he could see the world again, even if it was just for a day, and they let him. He enjoyed the manipulation and he always said he felt at home in prison. So these day trips were just sating his need for the outside. Clifford loved his power games and the authorities continuously gave him power over them. But he did also show that he wanted to escape. On one of his day trips, he would be taken to a hospital where they found a handcuff key in his rectum. Sounds like Boyo wanted to attempt another escape, and despite this, he was still allowed medical day trips. They still let him go out. He wanted to push his limits and play his power game, and they just continued to let him. But who am I? A voice on the internet. When he was denied, Clifford was asked why he kept applying for parole when he knew he would be denied, and he simply shrugged and said it was because it was his right. The man never showed any remorse for what he was doing, and he enjoyed seeing his name in the newspapers. He actually kept a scrapbook of newspaper clippings that he appeared in. The ego on this man was insane. The victim's families would come forward and attempt to sue Clifford for the money he had received for the death of their children in 2010. They had each received $10,000 for their suffering, but that was nothing compared to what Clifford had been given, and to be honest, this is fair. Clifford was paid for the killing of their children while these people were left with almost nothing. Terry's mom actually needed to ask for government assistance for her daughter's funeral. She wanted some compensation for that while Clifford had been living in prison luxury. Sharon Rosenfeld, mother of Darren Johnsrud, had began a victim's rights group called Victims of Violence with her husband and Darren's stepfather, Gary Rosenfeld. It's a non-profit organization advocating for victims and helping them through the traumatic legal processes. It's actually a really awesome organization and I will link to it in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. Its goal and aim is to help victims so that they don't feel lost in the legal system. Sharon was really hoping that if they got any money out of this, it would go to the organization. She started this organization to try and help people who had suffered like her and her son had, but every day is so difficult for her. She says it's like a dark cloud hangs over her and she cannot think of her son without thinking of what happened to him before he died. Gary Rosenfeld had died of lung cancer and as he died, he forgot everyone in his life. 
but he died screaming the name Olsen. Imagine your husband, your father, your brother, your son is dying from cancer and he has forgotten everyone except for the, the anger and the hatred towards the man that killed their son. The victims did not win the court case and did not see any of the blood money, nor did they see any of the pension money when they tried for that. Brigitte Norden, sister to Judy Cosma, went through non-stop terror after her sister was murdered. It felt like Clifford was on the news every three months, and it felt like she could never escape his brutality. Every time she heard his name, she would feel like he was right in front of her. Her mother would get drunk and leave the home in the middle of the night to be found passed out on Judy's grave the next morning. One of her brothers is in prison, and Brigitte blames the anger and pain the family felt since their sister's death and the failing to get her justice. Her father and brother and other sister would also turn to alcohol as the whole family just drifted further and further apart, unable to comfort each other through the turmoil and pain caused by one sick individual. Raymond Sr. would not give Clifford the satisfaction of reading a victim impact statement at the trial. In his heart, he knew Clifford got off on knowing he was still causing these families pain. He wore a button that day with a picture of his son and the names of each victim on the back of it. It was because of this case that victim impact statements would be mandatory at hearings, and authorities were mandated to think of victims throughout investigations. Should they not have already been throughout all of history? I'm, I'm not going to go too far into my frustration at that, but at least they were put in there now. But with that in mind, not much changed when we got around to Robert Picton, now did it? Clifford Olson died in 2011 of cancer to the relief of the victims' families. They just want to move on with their lives and forget about the cruelty and the pain that they endured at his hands. Something I honestly think everyone should respect. These people have been through more pain than I can imagine, but in pain comes change. Especially in the case of Sharon and Gary Rosenfeld with Victims Against Violence. Clifford Olson died at the age of 71, being able to live in his manipulative, happy comfort. I have to just say I'm sad that he got away with it so long and the authorities just continued to kowtow to this fucking narcissist. They just kept stroking his ego and shrugging their shoulders or scratching their heads, wondering why they aren't getting anywhere else or why things aren't getting easier. It boggles my mind because they just kept giving and giving and giving and wondering why he wasn't giving anything back without expecting things in return. It's, it boggles my mind that they thought that a criminal would... <sighs> but that is the story of Clifford Olson. May the 11 children that were ripped from this world so brutally rest in peace, knowing that the one who harmed them is finally gone and can no longer hurt anyone else. If you or anyone else are suffering from violence yourself, please reach out for help at your local helplines. You can find your province-specific ones at www.dawncanada.net forward slash issues forward slash crisis dash hotlines forward slash. It's an awesome directory listed by province. You just got to scroll through, find your province, find the helpline that most suits your needs based on the abuse you're going through or the crisis that you're dealing with and click on it and it will take you there. Again, it's www.dawncanada.net forward slash issues forward slash crisis dash hotlines forward slash. If you or someone you know is suffering from a mental health crisis or need someone to talk to about anything mental health related, you can dial 833-456-4566 for the Canadian Suicide Prevention Hotline. They're open 24-7, 365 a year, and they're available in both French and English. Again, 833-456-4566. And for my American listeners, your helpline is one 800 273 8255. I can't guarantee they're in French, but I can say they are open 24-7, 365 a year, and also open and willing to help you with anything mental health related. But if you feel it is more severe, please dial 911 or visit your local emergency room. You are worth all of the help that you can possibly get. All of the help that you feel even you don't deserve you need. You guys can find me on YouTube or anywhere you guys find your podcasts, all at Whispers in the Trees.
please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or in a comment on YouTube. I'm always looking for ways to improve and I am doing my best to turn this into a full-time thing. I would really love to continue to bring dark secrets to light, but here we are. Thank you so much for your continued support and for listening. You guys rock and stay safe out there. I care for each and every one of you.